As the rock era began to wrap up in the mid 90s, this alternative band that formed at LSU rocketed to number one on the modern rock charts with one of the feel good sing along songs of its time. Up next, the group's singer and bassist tells us the story behind this classic 90s hit with a thump and bass line and the real meaning behind the lyrics next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you are curious about the stories behind your favorite music and musicians, talking the soundtrack of your life, make sure that you subscribe right now. Right below, click the bell so you never miss out on our daily musical education straight from the legends. And also, don't forget to check out our exclusive content on Patreon. That really helps us keep this channel going. You know, it's interesting how every generation's relationship with music is different. I mean, for my own group, Generation X, that came of age in the 80s and 90s, I'm talking pre-Spotify, even pre-iTunes, back when albums on cassette or CD were a valuable commodity. I mean, unless you signed up for Columbia House's 10 CDs for a penny a bunch of times, it took three to four hours at your after-school job to earn enough to buy the physical product. And, you know, you had to choose wisely and also hope that the CD that you bought for that one song had at least five or six other decent songs so that you could listen through multiple times until you could get your next fix. It was few and far between. We didn't have a lot of money. I mean, especially for a kid like me that had to pay for my own gas, my own school clothes. You could always trust the, the new U2 or REM album or Motley Crue or Def Leppard, but it was a crapshoot with newer bands. Every now and again, you found that rare gem you know, that could get within the same ballpark, you know, something new that made you a believer in that artist long term. Well, for me, better than Ezra's Deluxe was that kind of album. So let me take you back to mid-1995, one of the greatest summers of my life. I just graduated from high school, finally free of the, the daily grind. I moved out on my own, you know, working construction outside the state of Idaho with a couple of my best buddies. Uh, no curfews, no adult supervision, cruising the strip at night, chasing beautiful girls, and Better Than Ezra's Deluxe was the soundtrack of that youthful romantic season. I'm sure it was for a score of other kids across the nation, some who were watching this. Better Than Ezra's song, Good, was my jam back then. Everyone knows the song from Tom Drummond's first bass lick, to Kevin Griffin's uh, laid back chorus. We play it over and over because at that moment, life was good, good, good. Oh, good, 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 good. But good wasn't the only song on the album that grabbed you, you know? There are other ones that shook you up something fierce like the track In The Blood. You know what I feel. And you had to to study the lyrics on that one because it was a true puzzle of emotion, very much a mystery. Kevin had a, a really dynamic sincerity within his vocal. It was an honesty that, that transferred to the listener. The band Better Than Ezra was formed in 1988, you know, with the aforementioned singer and guitarist Kevin Griffin, bassist Tom Drummond, uh, drummer Kerry Bonikazi and lead guitarist Joel Rundell, while the four of them were students at LSU. Their first gig was at a place called Murphy's in Baton Rouge. Uh, not long after they formed, they, they did play that gig. Now, nobody knows for sure where their band name came from. There have been a lot of urban legends thrown around, theories, uh, but Tom Drummond said that if you really knew the real story, it's really not that great. Uh, one of my favorite stories about it uh, is that the band apparently was nameless at the time that they participated in a Battle of the Bands competition. There was a band called Ezra that also competed. And since Kevin Griffin and the boys needed a band name to officially enter into that contest, they wrote down that they were better than Ezra. Now, I don't know if that's true, but better than Ezra definitely paid their dues when they were coming up. They recorded a demo in 1988. It was called the Chime Street Demo. <laughs> Again. Try and get gigs, a possible record deal. And, and then they released the cassette only album Surprise after that. Now, tragedy struck in the late summer of 1990 when their lead guitarist Joel Rundell took his own life. Uh, from there, the remaining members 
They took some time to ponder their future as a band, and they decided to continue with Better Than Ezra as a trio, playing frats and parties locally, and then they started playing throughout the South. Their breakthrough album, Deluxe, was released in 93 on its own indie label. It was called Swell Records. From there, the major label, uh, Elektra, came knocking, and that's where the band signed in 95. From there, the band shot to the mainstream with their first single, I've talked about it, the No Doubt About It smash good. That went to number one on the Modern Rock Tracks chart, like I said. It sent Deluxe across the Platinum sales line. Seven years of paying their dues. Um, that's how it used to be back then. Every time that I hear Deluxe, I am transported back to that amazing summer of wonder. I know every song on the album by heart, and decades later, it still feels good. Great music stands the test of time, and it speaks to multiple generations, as I've said. Better Than Ezra has that quality, with brand new Ezra lights coming into the fold all the time, including Taylor Swift, who has recorded one of their songs and has covered several others in her live show. Lead singer Kevin Griffin is also written with Blondie, Sugarland, and Meatloaf, just to name a few. It's very prevalent in the business. Um, I had the opportunity to interview both Kevin Griffin and bassist Tom Drummond on the story behind the number one hit, Good. What follows is really a cool conversation for two of music's good guys. They really are awesome. As we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Zenny has an amazing website where you can search for frames in a variety of different ways you know, to create your own unique frames, your own unique pair of glasses. You can tell you how you look before you buy, and you're going to spend less than you would for a brand new vinyl record. At zenny.com, you can see for yourself. Here's Better Than Ezra. Or maybe I'm just too frightened by the sound of it. I went from playing a, a telly copy. Uh, it was a Morris Japanese-made <laughs> telly copy uh, to playing a Les, a Les Paul you know, through a Marshall JCM 800 in a 4x12 cabinet. Yeah, we have and to just think about our parts. Yeah, and suddenly we became this full. power trio out of, out of a necessity, but also out of a kind of a tribute to Joel. We weren't going to go re replace him. We never have. And we started playing again, just baby steps, seeing how that was. And eventually, I, you know, Tom and Carrie at the time um, moved out to L.A. And, you know, we had odd jobs and we started making Deluxe, which has such an odd, you know, beginning, how that record started. Because in 93, um, you guys released it under your own label, right? Indie right. label. Swell Records. Looks sad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was living in L.A. and uh, I, had, I had made it an acoustic demo. Mm -hmm. um, in my apartment in, on, in West Hollywood. And it got some interest from some different entertainment lawyers. It got a lot, actually a lot of very famous A&R people reached out to me because I got a review in Music Connection magazine. It was a good review. You know, nothing came from those, uh, but one of the lawyers was uh, interested enough that it gave me the confidence to, to, to have uh, Tom and Carrie come out from Baton Rouge and to, we all moved in together in, in Beachwood Canyon in LA. And around that same time, my uh, girlfriend and I were in line for a movie. And when you live in LA, if you if you go to a mall, uh, it's not uncommon to have someone walk up and say, hey, do you want to go see a screening of this new movie with insert actor in it? You know, yeah, and it's yeah. free. And as a struggling uh, musician in LA, we were like, yeah, it's something to do. And so we were in line, my girlfriend and I were in line for, I can't recall the movie, but behind us was, uh, was a girl who was a, a dating uh, she said, you know, she was dating a musician and mm -hmm. that came out in the conversation. And I said, I was out here and we're, I'm trying to make a demo and stuff. And she goes, well, my boyfriend is a, uh, a musician and he's a producer and he has a studio and you should get together. It turns out that that boyfriend was Dan Rothschild, mm. whose father is Paul Rothschild. He's passed away now, uh, Paul, but Paul it produced The Doors, oh, yeah. Janis Joplin, yep. Mamas and the Papas, one of the you know seminal producers mm -hmm. of the 60s and 70s. He was the first producer who, ever, who brought the uh, idea of points, a producer getting points on a record, which yeah. was amazing. So we just by happenstance, serendipity, that began, by that chance meeting, began the, uh, the demos in a second floor apartment in West Hollywood on a half inch uh, analog tape began the demos 
that would eventually become deluxe. Um, Uber e- economical. <laughs> oh, mean, yeah. Really, you just can't really even describe it. I mean... I think it was $15 an hour. You know, half-inch well, tape. The, the, just... the thing was, uh, Dan had played one of the house bands in the Oliver Stone Doors movie. And in lieu of payment, they gave uh, Dan uh, the... Fostex half inch tape machine that they used in one of the scenes. Oh, wow. So that's what recorded Deluxe. <laughs> you know, and that was, that's you know, awesome. and, and so, I mean, it was, it was so, uh, by, uh, it was very DIY. I mean, we, we had our 82 Dodge Ram on, pulled up to the back of the apartment building. We put the, the Marshall cabinet in the van, ran the microphone cable out of the, out of the second floor window into the van. And that's how we recorded our guitars because you couldn't do it, you know, and it was, it was a plush, uh, shag carpet and paneling <laughs> custom van, like a like a predator van, uh, in the worst way. But who would, know, who would know that a sketchy van would also be a great acoustic environment to record a guitar? <laughs> so that's how we how we did it, and um, we would just you know in between shifts for me being a bartender and for Tom as a valet. We recorded these tracks, and most of the drums on Deluxe were recorded in a really scary rehearsal hall in East LA, in about a fifteen-hour, yeah. fifteen-hour uh, stretch. <laughs> All the drums wow. in uh, in this these these two guys, the the Rotter brothers, who had a bit of success in the uh, in the early nineties um, in LA, uh, lived in this rehearsal complex illegally. They took <laughs> they took sponge baths. <laughs> they had a sink, and it was so weird. And, and maybe wow. light. they've and never you, seen the light. If of day. you listen to <laughs> Deluxe, you'll notice that the BPMs, you know, wax yeah. and wane. They speed up and slow down throughout those songs because, uh, you know, we were we had one shot at it. Basically. We had one shot, and, no and, and if, more than anything, like they right. they speed up because we were like, let's get out of here. You know, <laughs> it's just good. yeah. So and it was around five in the morning. They started. It was in the meatpacking area of L.A. and they burn they burn out the sluices or some, some yeah. name for the meatpacking plants. And yeah. so this suddenly, you know, through the walls, this awful odor um, started coming through and that, that hastened our departure from the studio. <laughs> yeah. We like to think that if you hold up the original cassette, you can, you can still <laughs> smell it. It's a smell of rock. <laughs> yeah. It's a scratch and sniff cassette. Yeah, it yeah, is, or, right? Or CD. What's awesome about being a songwriter is you get to gift your song to the world, and then it meant something to you when you wrote it, but to every person it means something different, right? So for me, when I heard it, it was just like such a great summer, and it was kind of that song where you put on and you're just like, life is good. I remember going to um, a restaurant, and I heard, and Good came on, and I was singing to the top of my lungs, and I didn't realize I was, right? because I was just like, just feeling the music, and everybody in the restaurant was looking at me like, who's this crazy person? I was just... It's good. <laughs> and everybody's like, okay, this guy, right. that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Anyway, that's, the power that's of awesome. that song. The power, you know, that's again, a, another story that just like, I love hearing how how songs mean. It was freedom, story. man. It was like, oh, I've missed this song so much because music is the only thing really that is like a time machine that can transport you right back to that time and that place. Well, maybe I'm just too sure. I mean, that was the song we, that all of our friends would come up, we were playing it, and they would come up and be like, that's the song. They, like, they all knew. I mean, the, what's gr- amazing about it is that the lyrics weren't finished. Yeah, the, it's always, the, the wah-ah was always meant to be real lyrics. But I just never got around to it. And so we started playing it, and I was doing the wah-ah part, and people remembered that was the hook. Suddenly I was like, oh my God, this is the hook to the song. That's it. <laughs> and uh, who knew, you know, 25 plus years later uh, that, that, that I would still be singing, dancing around, singing wah-ah. What is the song about? I mean, I've heard so many different rumors about it because somebody's saying, oh, it's about a stalker that, that broke into Kevin's house. And, and then some people say, well, what, what is the, the <laughs> other lyrics about? The funny thing is, is uh, Dear John, some people You know, say it, it, it was really about, um, Writing the song, I, I had I was still with my girlfriend, uh, girlfriend at the time. That's a great song title, by the way. I need to make a note of that. Yes. <laughs> um, it was really about you know so often in a relationship, 
uh, when you break up, you're full of that uh, anger and uh, and uh, unexpressed emotion, mm-hmm. and you and you usually you know have bad thoughts you know uh, about the relationship. But good is really about like uh, someone reflecting right when after getting a dear John letter about all the things you, that you grew that from the relationship yeah. and, and how you're a better person. That person pushed you to do certain things uh, that you never would have done on your own. And it really, it's really about uh, getting rid of letting go of the anger and, and seeing all the amazing things that happened from that relationship and all the love that, that you got and how you grew as a person. And that's what the song is about. And the funny thing is I hadn't experienced that when the song was written. I ended up experiencing that, <laughs> but um, it, it's funny that the uh, the lyrics um, maybe were kind of a kind of looking into, into the future, but but I I really do like the, f- the fact that that's really what was the message of the song. That's cool, and that it's an optimistic message. One interesting thing musically about the song is that it's our only song where we have a modulation. Mm-hmm. A key change. The bridge is a key change with no lyrics. We never had done it prior nor since. And that's our biggest song. Maybe we should have done it more, more than often. Once. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what we were thinking. Why, why do we do that? I don't know either. Maybe it was Dan's idea. I don't really recall. I do know that the song, uh, we played it for the first time at this odd club that was a double wide trailer <laughs> in Jackson, Mississippi. It was called <laughs> WC w- Don's. W-C Don's. You know, a place where you needed a tetanus shot after you played <laughs> uh, the club. Yeah, I played a lot of those, by the way. But yeah. that was really, that was also, that song was really, I, w- I was super into Bob Dylan at the time. Obviously, R.E.M. and the Pixies. And I, and I loved how Dylan could uh, write a song with four chords that didn't change. But because of the melody, it had those transitions. It became a full song. And that was a challenge to me because... If you listen, so the hallmark of early songwriting is usually it's too complicated, you know? And so this was a song about stripping everything away, making it simple, um, using four chords and, and the truth. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Better Than Ezra. Do you remember this song? Tell us your memories and thoughts on the mid 90s and the music that was being released at this time or about a song like me that was a feel-good song for your summer. Make sure to subscribe below to join our music community and to get more content, click on our Patreon link below. It really helps us do more videos, more interviews, because it's so important to keep the music alive. That is our goal. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm